William Rubber Willie Schindel is my name. The Rubber Willie is a nickname, obviously, that was given to me when I first discovered rubber as a fetish. Uh, tonight is Mr. International Rubber 2012. It is the 15th annual Mr. International Rubber Contest. Uh, and my affiliation to this whole thing started in 2002 when I won the title of Mr. International Rubber. My title is 2003 though, it's very strange. Um, shortly after I won the title, I went behind the scenes and started um, coordinating the weekend. And I became the weekend coordinator as my official title. And three years ago, along with my business partner, we bought the contest from the bar that owned it. And now it is a separate freestanding entity. Uh, so we're not reliant on any bar or anything and we can do what, it, what we like. It's allowed us to expand the event greatly. The history of the contest is there was an event in Boston uh, and we, the Boston event kind of faltered. And so over time there was an event that was created in Chicago to replace that. Uh, and that event initially was Mr. Vulcan Rubber. Uh, and when they couldn't negotiate the move of that title to Chicago, they created Mr. International Rubber. Uh, the first year there was competition with IML, they created their own competition to compete against, to try and corner the rubber market because it's so big. Uh, and uh, Mr. International Rubber has always been in Chicago ever since. There's been talk of moving it, but um, just logistically, because everybody who coordinates it is here and we know the, the venues, it just seems to be a, a good location for it. We're still toying with the idea of possibly taking it to Europe every other year or something, but for right now, Chicago in November in rubber. So far, it's it's paid off for most of the time, so. What gets people into rubber? Um, a lot of people will recall back to various different things in their childhood. Um, so some people, for some people who may be of a little bit of an older generation than the, the younger generation, a lot of them, it's Jacques Cousteau. When they were kids growing up, they would see Jacques Cousteau's underwater adventures, and they'd see all these guys in these wetsuits diving through, and they'd come out, and they'd you know, the, be glistening off of that, and that was just kind of like hot men, neoprene, and that kind of did it. Other people talk a lot about boots, like from when they were a kid. Um, some people, the, the first rubber thing that they have is the purple bandage on broccoli, the purple rubber band. So a lot of it comes from a lot of different people. I think uh, most people start in leather because that's mainstream, you know, now in the age that we live in. And then they will branch off from leather to explore other areas. And one of those other areas that they would explore could be rubber. Um, for me personally, I was introduced to rubber by uh, on vacation in Florida. Uh, I met a very handsome Italian man at the Eagle, I think it was, in Fort Lauderdale. And I ended up going back to his place. He had a big duffel bag and he said, do you mind if I pull out my chaps? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'm into all that, you know. And I was expecting leather chaps, but what he pulled out was rubber chaps. And there's just a sound that rubber makes when it moves and it's almost like those uh, stage props where they make thunder. It has that same kind of quality to it when it shakes. It, there's just a sound and I, I wasn't looking, I heard it before anything. I was like, what's that? And uh, yeah, he introduced me and I abandoned my friends and spent the next six days at his place uh, having a great time. And the rest is history for me. Rubber is still a little bit on the fringes in the gay community. In the straight community, in the straight fetish community, rubber is like the be all and end all because they're You'll, most of the magazines that are out there are devoted to women in rubber, skin to uh, those kinds of things. And it's all about getting those women in the corset and getting their boobs as high as possible, getting them shiny and making them a, a living doll. Getting in and out of it, uh, I always recommend that people who are new to it, um, there's a couple of key pieces that I call my, my starters. Uh, so the first would be a, a, a shirt. I typically recommend sleeveless just because they're a little bit easier to deal with. Once you go over the shoulder blade, it gets a little complicated. Um, and I always make sure that it's got a zip up the front. Without the zip, then you have to go, you have to figure out how to get it on and that's a little bit more experienced effort. Uh, and then also a pair of shorts uh, with a zip uh, all the way around the front. And I tell people, get a pair of shorts, drop some lube down the front of the shorts, get your balls all lubed up, and then just go for a jog and everything's gonna be slipping and sliding around and it's just, it's a really erotic feeling. So 
So first off is the zip. After the zip, then it takes a little bit of a trial period to figure out how it works. Typically, I lube up the inside and the outside with silicone lube. Uh, and then once you've got it lubed up on the inside and out, it's gonna slip fairly easily. So I bunch it up towards the shoulders here, slide your arms in, pull it over the head. At that point, you're gonna have it stuck right here across your back. And you may see some lines on the back of my shirt. I haven't polished up yet. And at that point, you either have a friend who helps you or you learn how to do a shoulder roll or you reach up underneath and you pull uh, it down. If you've got long arms and you can get up there, you can slowly pull it down. You can also pull it up this way and unbunch it. And it's a little bit of an effort to get it in, but once you're in, it's great. Um, getting out of it is much simpler. Uh, you jump in the shower, uh, you get some Dawn dishwashing liquid, you clean off your gear at the same time that you're getting out of it, and the water running under it will act as a natural lubricant to allow you to just swoop and you're right out. The bad part about that is if it starts to rip and it's molded, there's nothing to stop that rip from going. And we call those blowouts. So if you get a blowout on a molded piece, it's just gonna go and it's not gonna stop anywhere. Okay. If the next level up from that would be something that's seamed. So you're gonna have a, a seam down the side. And if you have something that's seamed, that means it's, it's made by hand. Uh, and that's gonna be a little bit more expensive, but it's more tailored and more quality made in that regard. Don't discount eBay though. Um, I purchased a lot of my stock basic items on eBay. Um, electrical lineman's gloves, um, rubber boots, there's all sorts of things you can find on eBay uh, if you're just looking to complement or accessorize your outfit. We're, we're open to anyone attending. We would love to have anyone who's interested in kink and fetish to attend our event. Uh, we made a significant move up uh, when we moved to the center on Halstead, which is Chicago's Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgendered Center, they opened the doors for us and they said, the kink community is part of our community and most gay, lesbian centers in the United States wouldn't do that. Our event is very personal. Um, everybody walks away and we program it that way. Everybody walks away from our event having met someone new. Uh, we really focus on building community. Um, and we focus on having fun, and I think that that kind of differentiates us from all the other events. We have a huge demo space in our market, so if you've never tried something, you want to try it. So I think we've got enough to differentiate ourselves. Um, I, I think we want to stay in that, you know, small to mid-size contest. We don't want to get too big. I think the larger LGBT community, the leaders of the larger LGBT community, whoever they are, uh, self-imposed or you know selected by some board like HRC whatever um, I don't think there's really been a serious discussion with the kink community I don't think I don't think the rest of the gay community has ever sat down and said why do you have to get into this gear what why why do you need this you know what does this do for you uh, why is this the image that you're sending for our community um, do you think they value the contributions of the kink fetish community to the larger community? Um, God. I think it's a mixed bag. I think if you ask someone historically the role of Leatherman, and it's not just us, I think it's anything on the fringe. I mean, we've, the movement has centralized a lot and become very mainstreamed. And I think that, um, you know, look back to when Stonewall happened, everybody was trying to be outside the norm. We were trying to be rebels, we were trying to be different. And now we're fighting for marriage, equality, and the right to adopt kids, and I mean, we have become mainstream. Uh, and I think the same thing is going on within the gay community, that the gay community has become mainstream, and we're still considered on the fringe of it, and actively trying to be on the fringe and preserve the fringe. I think there's definitely a large group that see, you know, the kink community as the embarrassment of the pride parade. Uh, I'm frankly embarrassed that, you know, here in Chicago, one third of our pride parade is politicians and news media floats, you know, trying to court us. Pride parades have turned into a commercial, a commercialization, exploitation of the gay community. Um, yeah, so. We're marginalized to an extent by the gay community, but you have to allow yourself to be marginalized. If you don't take control of your life and your community, then 
you know, you're allowing yourself to be marginalized. You have to be active, you have to be out there changing the community, involved in your community, supporting your community. And uh, I really see Mr. International Rubber as being part of that. We're, we're really community focused. We really want our contestants to go on to do something regardless of where they place on our competition. We know that they're going to go back and they're going to do something great in their community, be it fetish oriented or whatever else they choose to do in their community. The contest is an excuse to gather a bunch of like-minded people together. That's all it is. The person who gets the sash tonight is not endowed with mystical powers or anything, and they don't have a cape that they're going to be able to fly around the world and save, you know, the gay community from whatever it is. We view the contest as an excuse to gather together a bunch of people who share the same fetish, to share in that experience, and our contest is designed as entertainment. I believe that contests, as a person who has been a contestant, has been a judge, has produced a contest, has helped people set up contests, I believe there's a secondary value to the contest, and that's to help groom leaders through the process. It provides that opportunity for contestants to meet with leaders from the community who have gone before them to help them expand their mindset and, and beyond what their, their current place and time is. Uh, the contestant interview is probably the, the key moment of that. It's where the judges just drill the contestants with questions uh, that really, in good scenarios, challenge the contestants' beliefs and understanding of where they are and who they are. Ideally, it doesn't challenge them to the point that it breaks them down. That's not the goal. But it challenges them to think beyond what they know and who they are to incorporate other perspectives of people who've gone before them and to think about topics in different ways. Um, we try not to be political. Uh, we don't take a stand on any of the major issues, but it's important that our contestants be able to address those issues. Because if you win the sash and you're out in the real world, any of those questions are gonna come to you. So I tell my judges, any question is on the table. There's nothing that's off the table because the minute you walk out the door, you're in a parade parade wearing that, someone's gonna ask you, you know, something about ass fucking, you know, or, you know, how do you clean out and wh whatever. I mean, there's gonna be all sorts of crazy questions. And we need to know how they're gonna answer those questions or respond to that kind of pressure in the interview um, and help them through that process, you know, give them critiques. The title circuit has exploded. Um, and that's, there's good and bad. I mean, if clubs are dying and bars are dying, contests could be a means by which the community thrives and survives. It could be the legacy of the community. I don't think it's going to be the only legacy, and I hope it wouldn't be the only legacy. But it's a means to keep the community perpetuated, and if for nothing else, an excuse to gather everyone together for one weekend. You know, I think it's valuable.